Welcome to the podcast Beer and People from Beer Story Brew House. Beer Stories is normally a YouTube channel with tips, guides, and how to videos for homebrewing, but I also do interviews with exciting people in the beer industry, and these are very suited for the podcast format, and you'll find them all right here. Hey, George. Hey, Ron. Hi, Lars. Hey, Lars. Hey. Uh, well, first of all, can you tell me a little bit about who you are? So, George, you can start. Yeah, I'll go first. My name is George. I've been uh, at the Moors level for the past two and a half years. I'm the ad brewer. So currently I'm uh, in charge of developing recipes and focusing on the creative part of brewing, making sure that uh, we can uh, get exciting beers out there, be that a stout, an IPA, barrel aged stout, adjunct stout, or something else. So that's pretty much what I do around here. Cool. And hi guys, I'm uh, Rowan. I've been with the Moors Little for about one and a half years now. Um, I'm head of cellar fermentation. So I tweak the beers so they become perfect for packaging. Um, I'm about the fermentation, the yeast, and the final flavor tweaks. Uh, so that, that's about what I do there. So. Yeah. Fun to be here, Lars. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Hope it's gonna be cool. Well, uh, I think we should have something to drink. Um, I'm gonna drink uh, motor oil, which is your Russian Imperial Stout. And uh, we're actually gonna talk a little bit about this beer and uh, how it's brewed and go into details with this. And also the barcode. Um, which one do you have all the details on? Is that the barcode? Uh, we got both. We know Motor Oil by, by art. It's one okay. of the core range beers that uh, have been to, together with us at the Moose Little for, well, ever since we started brewing uh, back in 2016. So it's uh, quite a staple beer yeah. around here. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um... So, just to pronounce your brewery correct, it's called Moorsleutel. Moorsleutel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Moorsleutel. Moorsleutel. Yes, perfect. What defines Moorsleutel as a brewery? Do you think? We try to achieve perfection in a holistic way, so that never really happens. So we're always trying to prove our beers, but at core, we try to make these big, bold flavorful beers, which means we take a lot of risks uh, in the recipes we develop, bringing very extreme yet balanced beers, but we're never sh shy from a challenge. We call ourselves the beer engineers because of the four brothers that founded the company. Uh, all of them are engineers. We actually also run a sister company called Zomerdijk Engineering. That's an engineering company uh, providing solutions for uh, in-feed and out-feed of packaging uh, materials for other breweries and other uh, small companies like ourselves. So we always like to face a challenge and try to come on top of it. So that's why we aim to get these legendary beers uh, brewed. Ah, cool, awesome. Yeah, so let's talk a little about about a little bit about your stouts. Um, what defines a good stout in your mind, an imperial stout? I'll let Ron take this one first. Um, what, what defines an imperial stout? For us, it's uh, always going into uh, one of the most important things is uh, texture, the thickness, uh, but also the, the bold flavors, as in what kind of roast are you picking up? How are you balancing the beer with uh, yeast and hops or adjuncts? I'm not sure. The, yeah, the barcode uh, has an adjunct, I think, Tonka, but uh, no big pastry stouts today. Um, but we're always looking in how, how can we balance that beer in a way, even after recipe development, when it gets into tank, when it gets into the bright beer tank, what can we do to make it even up more? That's the idea uh, in our Imperial Stouts. Yeah, sure. So, so, so when you make a stout or make any beer, 
you're not done making the beer just after uh, the, the brewing part. No, the, no. The cellar part it's means just as much. Or, uh, yeah, that's a, I'm a bit biased, of course, because yeah. <laughs> I, I run that department, so it's a, but yeah, I, I think it's very important to look after the, the yeast and the beer. Um, but I also mean like, uh, sometimes we have adjuncts in mind that if we do trials, it just doesn't work out. And what defines our stouts at that point is being able to tweak it in a different way to make it the best we possibly can. So it's, it, it, it doesn't stop at recipe development and the brew day, no. but it goes all the way to the packaging. Yeah. yeah. It's funny because whenever people talk about stouts, we always tend to think about the style guidelines. They were very uh, heavily implemented by the uh, US uh, philosophy of uh, getting into style guidelines. We try to see beer more as a flavor component, like Rowan was saying. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the traditional stout, it has roasted barley in its composition. And we don't always use roasted barley because we believe to, well, we can craft it in some different ways. We don't need to follow those guidelines to make a great stout. And that's the proof that we've been doing hundreds of stouts these years and they all go different approaches. And usually they share similarities, of course, but mm. they always have the a soul of their own. Yeah. So you don't have a base recipe that you use for, for most of your stouts? No, that would be quite boring. I mean, yeah. if we had a base recipe, that if we had a base recipe and we just made the same recipe all over again, just changing the flavors, that would be uh, no fun. Yeah. The fun in, in here, it's uh, like cooking. You know, you just get uh, a set of tools and you just uh, combine different flavors. So pretty much all beers that we uh, brew, all stouts, uh, they have different uh, recipes. And I'm being completely honest. Like we try to get. Uh, adjusted recipe for each of the stouts we uh, brew to make them. Uh, I mean, if we want nutty flavors to go, we'll choose a different base uh, malt, or if we want more dry or whatever it comes to be, we try to adjust it based on the project we're uh, working on. Hmm. So, what about the the motor oil? Um... What can you tell us about that in terms of recipe and how did you come up with the recipe and and is there something special about it? I, I I don't get that much roasted flavors in this I actually get more like uh, sweet molasses and I get uh, I get dried fruit and then maybe a little bit of uh, of coffee or yeah but it's not that yeah, so dry uh, not not that burnt yeah, flavors or roasted flavors. Um, yeah. As well as uh, eight different uh, malts, if memory serves me right, uh, we um, do some base malt, um, usually some uh, pale ale malt as a base malt. We uh, layer it up with a little bit of Munich and uh, wheat malt as well to get some complexity on the base. Uh, then we layer different types of uh, caramel and melanide in the uh, malts. And we have quite a high portion of uh, dark grains, but none of those are roasted barley. I think that's why you don't pick up a lot of roasted note into it, more of the deep molasses kind of licorice uh, notes. That's from uh, black malt, chocolate malt, and uh, specialty. So that's uh, roughly where we touch base on the, these dark malts. All of our stouts are double mashed. I don't want to get too technical, I guess, but uh, pretty much we're just using more grains, less water, trying to get the most concentrated worth possible to increase the OG and therefore ABV as well. But uh, not only that, but to concentrate flavors as well. Yeah. So everything is double mashed on that purpose. So what, what is your water to grist ratio if you have the a big mash? It's yeah, it's for about two liters per kilo of grain. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a big that's mash. our sweet point. Um, that's yeah, that's a pretty thick mash, and uh, it's our sweet point uh, between uh, the grains quantity, uh, kettle size, everything vessel size. We try to use less we're able to. But we, uh, it just doesn't work out because it's too little uh, work collected. So two liters per kilo of grain is usually where we find our right balance where we like the beers. Yeah, okay. You, you, you kind of have to point out that we have a mesh filter though, George. So we, we don't have the trouble of uh, going through a painful louter. <laughs> ah, okay. So you can almost, uh, yeah, you can almost mesh flour. 
with that, right? Yeah, that's pretty much what we do. Yeah, that's what characterizes uh, MASH filter for yeah. uh, who's out there listening as they will, might be curious. So it's pretty much a set of plates um, as if it was a filter, like a lager beer filter, a plate filter, where the slurry from the MASH gets thinned out per plate. And uh, that just allows for efficiency to be uh, way higher than the regular water. So we're able to aim about 80% efficiency in our stouts. It gets higher with IPAs, but uh, on stouts, uh, we get about 80%. But it's not only about efficiency, that's the uh, economical uh, standpoint and viewpoint, but I think more like flavor uh, improvement. Yeah. So we installed the filter at about two years now. I think it's right about two years that we first commissioned the mash filter. But in terms of flavor, it really captures the essence of the grains you're using. So just the depth of flavor just gets way more complex when you have such a, a tool at your disposal. And that allows us to mash thicker and all that. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you're not using rice holes or anything uh, in that? No, that's just flour. So we we have a hammer mill, contrary to the typical roller mill, where we do both our roasted and regular grains through the hammer mill. Grains everything to a flour consistency, uh, makes kind of a paste, but uh, the husk is still present, the malt husk. Yeah. And the filter enough is enough to filter the work. We don't need to add any uh, additional husks anymore. We used to use them. Okay. So I, are you adding, uh, because that thick mash, and I'm just thinking all the enzymes may have hard to to do their work in such a thick mash. Do you, uh, do you add any enzymes to the, to the mash? No, we've uh, made some uh, trials, but we uh, see um, a loss of quality if we do exogenous enzymes, so we uh, tend not to use them. Eventually, if we have some... Uh, different grains such as uh, buckwheat, like we've used in the past, or rye, we may get to the point of using it to uh, aid the process, but we usually try to uh, fade away. Uh, it's it's funny that you mentioned the enzymes. It's actually a very good point. Uh, that would usually be a problem, but our mashing system uh, guarantees that the grains and water are mixed perfectly. So during the process of mashing in, you're getting conversion on the spot immediately because the water and the grains are being mixed evenly as they're moved from the grist box into the mash tun. So we've seen a pretty good results with the 30 minute mash rest. We don't see a huge difference on going a full hour. So, uh, and we've done thoroughly tests on uh, enzyme concentrations and conversion, and we've been clear so far. Okay. What is, uh, in the, do you know the OG in the, Motor. Yeah, it's usually around uh, 30 Play-Doh. Okay. So, so that's uh, 1120. Yeah, 1120. Okay, yeah. Uh, what's the final gravity? Goes to between 10 and 12 Play-Doh, I think. Oh, okay, so usually. 10, 30, what's that? 10, 40, 10, 40. And, and 48, something like that. 10, 40. 1050, something okay. like that. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's pretty high, but it's not pastry stout high, I would say. No, no. It, yeah. It's a really, really good imperial stout, I must say. Um, so what, what role does the hops play in this? Because uh, this still, it still feels balanced. It's not overly sweet, even though you said that the final gravity is 1040. It's not overly sweet. Um, it's still taste balanced, I think. So what's, uh, I'm guessing it's the hops that does that or what? I think it's the amount of uh, hops, definitely. We use about, I think, uh, uh, one, two, 10 grams. I can make the calculation here quickly. Like 60 IBU, right? Yeah, 60 it's about 60 IBU, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think the 60 IBU may seem a little bit low for the beer. That is, if you look at some classical imperial stouts, they usually have higher IBU. I now think of uh, North Coast uh, Old Rasputin. I think it's around 90, for example, one of the classic imperial stouts. Yeah. But I think that uh, the fact we use whereabouts 15% to 20% uh, dark grains 
So pings above uh, 600 EBC also imparts a lot of bitterness. Yeah. So we tend to see uh, hops as the only bittering and balancing factor in beer, because that's the majority of beers we drink and we're used to think about beer as a, you know, pale yellow liquid or pale ale or whatever. When you're talking about beer, when you talk about research in beer, no one really touches base on stouts. So I think it uh, plays a huge role in stouts, uh, the roasted malt or dark malts, to balance out some sweetness too. So that's why we're able to, in some extreme cases, to go up to nearly 30% roasted grains okay. and still have balance, balanced beers. So yeah. it's in the end, it's all about balance. Yeah. So 30% roasted grains and then almost no hops, or how does that work? Yeah, usually we aim for the same amount of hops. Uh, that's one of the things we have nearly constant okay. in most of our stouts, uh, except the ones that go full on exploring hops. Uh, we've had some beers, some dark beers that we explore hops a lot, but on a regular motorel or non adjunct stouts or some of the pastry stouts, we usually have a pretty uh, standardized hopping rate because we know it just works to our profile. Yeah, cool. Um, what kind of hops do you use uh, for bittering? Is it in? Uh, is uh, it... Mag Mag Magnum, Magnum. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you, you're not using extracts for bittering? No, no? we uh, use them for a little while just to trial with them, but uh, we think that uh, using actual hops, so there's a lot of things that uh, you capture from the hops that help get more uh, depth and complexity to a beer. Okay. Uh, be that a salad or an IPA. So we've used extracts, but I think those processing aids, they are just processing aids uh, with the expense of flavor and we like flavor. So we like to keep the real stuff around. Yeah, awesome. Are you adding any uh, flavor or aroma hops? To the uh, not too much, not too much oil, no. Uh, it, depending on the recipe we may, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. Sometimes we dry up them. We've treated some uh, stouts as uh, IPAs, so doing a double dry up uh, okay. on them as well. It really depends on which style of stout we're trying to go for. So yeah. we specialize in stouts. We've made uh, several hundred of different recipes. So it really depends uh, what we're trying to achieve. But we like to see stout as a canvas to play around with uh, things. Yeah. So. How can you continue to uh, develop hundreds of recipes for Imperial Stouts and they all seem to just taste great? <laughs> Who inspires uh, you? <laughs> I think, yeah, that's a good question, actually. Uh, I think it's uh, partly a uh, experience, though, that we, we know how to produce the great wort now. Uh, but you can do so much within the imperial stout category that it it, it doesn't really pour. There's uh, we make so so many specials that the the yeah it doesn't get it really get boring. No. Um, uh, well, it has to do with planning and the freedom we have to make our own planning. I guess if we were always to make the same. Uh, pastry style stouts of going through, you know, like chocolate, vanilla, coffee, and a mix of these. Uh, that could get boring eventually, but since we're allowed to explore different adjuncts, I don't know, we've used from hibiscus to black cardamom. Uh, it's, yeah, I, I even lost count. Like uh, we're working on some uh, cherry beets right now. We've done a date syrup. We've done, done honey. I mean, it's countless of things where allowed to experiment around. And I think that's the nice challenge that each beer is unique and we try to always come up with something that makes it stand out. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, you do. Cool. So, um, yeah, we're not going to talk that much about adjuncts, but, uh, but what about minerals? How are you treating your water? Oh, that's a good one, yeah. It's probably uh, one of the most overlooked things in a beer, I'd say. Uh, we were able to change our beers uh, 180 degrees by just picking the water profile, especially on these beers. Like, as, as I was mentioning before, all of the research and uh, scientific knowledge that you can find about beer 
usually goes about either pale ales or regular beers like lagers. No one's doing research on stouts. No. So it's pretty difficult for us that we spend a lot of uh, time reading about beer, drinking beer to find what other brewers are doing, uh, you know, taking actual uh, college degrees to see if we can find anything. But we always get to this paper talks about lagers. So it's pretty difficult to us because we need to find a lot of these things ourselves because no one is doing, I would say, uh, don't quote me on this, but likely worldwide, no one's doing as much hectoliters of stouts over 10% ABV as we are. So we are quite a unique uh, brewery on that standpoint. So that allows us to do a lot of our own research, but that also comes with a lot of risk. So we've changed our water profile um, throughout the, the years. We use tap water pretty much, just local sourced water. Uh, I can let Rowan uh, talk about his pride in uh, Dutch water, but it's uh, a thing. We're very pr proud of our uh, <laughs> local water. But nonetheless, it needs to... water there? It's pretty hard uh, okay. water. Uh, which is quite cool for the, the stouts. It really helps to balance out because, uh, you know, the acidic notes on the dark rings will bring the pH down, but we still need to correct by the amount of uh, dark rings we use. But I can say it makes a world of a difference focusing on water. To us, that's challenging because we need to test it several times to get the right profile. Yeah, yeah. So what minerals do you add to it? Uh... Yeah, is it uh, calcium or chlorides or, or what are you focused on? Do you want to go, Roa? You know them by art? Um, usually it's calcium. No, it's not calcium chloride, right? It's uh, bicarbonate and the slate lime right now. We switched it around a couple of months ago. We uh, do for certain beers, certain water profiles. So, I think where it started was the British stout a couple months ago. We started using uh, slaked lime instead of uh, calcium carbonate. Okay. Instead of, uh, so, very so, so, sodium bicarbonate. That's sodium bicarbonate. Lime. And uh, slaked lime, it's uh, calcium hydroxide. So pretty much you, have, you want alkaline stuff to balance out the uh, acidity in your dark rings. So you maintain... Uh, the desired mash pH. But the thing is, all of these things, they are uh, flavor compounds, so they can uh, impact your beer. Maybe if you're tweaking with a, a tiny portion, you want too much, but uh, we need to add them in quantity because we're dealing with a lot of these dark rings and a lot of cereal. So we can have an impact in the flavor. So depending on each recipe, we try to adjust the water profile to uh, aim it uh, where we want it to be. So for some beers, uh, if you're looking for uh, additional body, for example, you use some calcium chloride mm. to get some more body. You may use some uh, magnesium sulfate or calcium sulfate to enhance uh, hops and bring out some bitterness and provide some drying to beers. Uh, some other beers, you may use sodium bicarbonate to get a more round flavor because it has, as the name suggests, sodium, as in content of table salt. So that brings a more round uh, flavor enhancing perspective. Uh, if you're doing like a Baltic porter, for example, it's something softer that's uh, well fermented with the lager yeast. So the whole profile just cleaner. And then uh, we may use the calcium hydroxide, the slate lime, because that one just uh, imparts kind of a smoothness uh, into the beer. So we tend to adjust our mineral additions uh, depending on what we want to get. Yeah. You also do multiple different of the minerals, right? Because if you go very high on one of the minerals, you uh, pass the flavor threshold, and uh, that would just get nasty at some point. Yeah. So it's uh, it's the same as uh, sweeteners. If you combine sugar and uh, aspartame or something, uh, you get one. If you do both, it's great because you're both uh, below the uh, threshold. If you do a lot of one, you uh, you get above the flavor threshold and you get a tang or a uh, weird sweetness. So that's what we do with the salts as well. It's, yeah. uh, it's tweaking all the time, I would say. Yeah, cool. Um, 
I don't know if the camera can see this, but uh, but did you mention that that the motor oil was about six hundred EBC, or did I get that wrong? It's like one hundred and thirty. Okay, okay, one hundred thirty. That's still. I'm sorry. Really sixty, one hundred thirty. I don't know what the calculator is. It's hard to tell about the certain EBC. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It is. Yeah. Above yeah. hundred, it's all, all the same. I would say yeah. almost. But it is really, really dark, and the head yeah, on so it is do... a beautiful color. The foam. We've done these things of sending beaters out for lab analysis on the multiple uh, range of things, things that maybe even most uh, hobby brewers don't even think about ever. But the one thing we never worried about was uh, EBC because all of our beers are kind of black. Yeah. So <laughs> not all, but you know, all the stouts get to a point where they're black. Uh, we don't even bother trying to figure out the exact uh, no. EBC. So no. So when you such a dark beer. Um, is there a lot of uh, carafa or huskless grains in this, or, or, or why is it not more roasted than than it is? You take this one. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the amount and the balance between the base malts and the um, dark grains. We don't use uh, carafa, so we don't use any German malts uh, except for the melanoidin, which is not even a vitamin source; it's some other uh, maltster. Um, we are. Uh, well, we don't use a specific uh, grain provider, so we like to make our life more difficult and the logistics more difficult. So we just buy uh, malts everywhere because I think, I mean, caramel malts, it's perceived as being one, but if you buy it in uh, England, Germany or Belgium, they're widely different. Mm. So depending on um, the profile we want, we may switch them around. Montreal is mostly uh, Belgium. Uh, malts because that was what was available and proximate to us at the time uh, and we still uh, stick to those uh, grains but for some other beers we uh, use British ingredients German whatever it gets to uh, but I think it's not as much the grain itself but the balance between the caramel malts which is also high in a percentage when compared to base malt so we don't use much base malt that's what I'm pretty much saying okay how much uh, how much caramel malts is in this one, and how many roasted malts? Oh, I'll try to say this by heart. I'm picking it up. <laughs> I'd say uh, less than twenty, but close to twenty percent on uh, roasted grains. Okay. Um, and about thirty yeah. some percent. I think it's like ten ish. No, twenty percent. Everything mm -hmm. that was supposed to go through the roller mill that goes through the amber mill. Chocolate sure. dry, special B, and both M roasts. Oh, I thought we were talking about caramel. Yeah, also. Yeah, that. so roasted, yeah. roasted, roasted is uh, twenty percent and. About thirty percent, twenty to thirty percent. Okay. Caramel malts. Okay. Yeah, the rest divided between uh, Munich, wheat, and uh, pale malt. Yeah. Okay. Whoa, that's a lot. Interesting. Cool. Um, so, moving on to talking uh, a little bit about uh, mashing. Um, yeah, first of all, what, what are you are you doing a single mash, a step mash, or? or yeah, or what? Uh, is the beers, most of the beers, or all the beers, or how are you making them? Yeah, all the beers are double mashed, as I, uh, we mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, it's a single single step infusion. We try to get uh, on the high end of a conversion point. So we aim for uh, between 69, 71C uh, mash rest temperature. And uh, yeah, we've covered the mash thickness, two liters per kilo of grain used, and just a single infusion. That's the way our kit is uh, built, so we don't have any control over uh, mash temperatures. And pH, we usually aim for the higher range. Uh, it's a 5.4 pH, 5.5 depending on the uh, beers, yeah. uh, to achieve uh, maximum conversion in the as little time as possible. 
But the, how are you uh, adjusting your pH? Is that with the lactic acid or is it acidulated malts or how are you doing that? Well, for the IPAs, we do a blend of acids. Uh, as Ron mentioned, acids, especially acids, they go easily above a flavor threshold. So we tend to keep them down and make a blend between uh, lactic and uh, phosphoric acid to keep the uh, flavor threshold in check. For uh, stouts, it's the other way around. We want to have some uh, alkalinity added to it, so we cover that briefly, but uh, we use chalk, which is uh, calcium carbonate. We use slaked lime, which is calcium hydroxide, and we use sodium bicarbonate to correct those things, depending on which uh, style we're aiming for. Yeah. Um, yeah, but how long are you mashing for? Is it under an hour or it's just it's a... about 30, about 30 minutes. Okay. Um, our system has a pretty f efficient uh, mixing system on the way to the mash tun. So it basically uh, dispenses water at the same rate great uh, grains are being dispensed. So all grain gets moist before it gets to the uh, mash tun and that allows for the conversion to happen pretty quickly. And we've made several tests to guarantee that the 30 minute is uh, enough. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. That, that saves a lot of energy as well. So the whole sustainability uh, aspect is, is great there too. Yeah. Okay. So uh, moving over to the boil, what do you think uh, a boil time? How long are you boiling for? So it's an hour usually. It uh, depends a bit on what we are, uh, what we want to achieve. But uh, usually stouts are an hour. If we want some kind of barley wine or beer that goes into barrels, we might go a bit longer. Uh, okay, why is that? But, but an hour usually uh, is more than enough. Yeah. So why are you boiling longer if it goes in a barrel? Get the the complexity of the caramelization and the Maillard reactions inside of the kettle. So we have a direct fire kettle. Um, means that you have certain hot spots in the kettle uh, that get very hot, uh, by which you get very fast caramelization and Maillard reaction. Meaning that usually an hour is enough to create flavor. We have done boils as long as four or five hours. And then you really see the also the volume going down. You see the uh, it just gets so much richer. But uh, yeah, four or five hours is just not doable for every beer. It's only for the very special special beers. <laughs> yeah. So that's why we sometimes do it. Uh, not for all beers. Yeah. So a five-hour boil. What does it do for the beer? Um, is it just more concentrated and more flavorful, or, or, or what, what do you feel that it does? It, it, it brings, to me, it usually brings out the, the base malt a lot more. Um, it's quite interesting if you use like something like Golden Promise or Maris Otter. Um, you really get more breadiness, uh, some caramelization on the, on the, on the breadiness, mm. um, toasty. Yeah, just it gets to the next level, I would say, right, George? You experiment yeah. much more with this, but uh... yeah, I quite like the long boiled uh, approach. I know we've made some uh, pretty cool beers with it, recall, especially on the barley wine side. I think we're still yet to try on a long boil. Uh, when I'm saying long, I say like five, six, ten hours, like an actual long, long boil. Yeah, we still are to experiment that with a uh, stout. The most we've done was, I don't know, four, five hours on the stout. But we're planning on sometime this year to get onto a long boil, make a triple mash kind of beer um, for some special. But for the barley wines, we do a lot. That really contributes flavor. It's difficult to explain because we've made the same recipe with and without a long boil, and it just transforms the beer completely. I know it sounds like a bit crazy, but if we, it's not only sugar content it's also flavor development because we can make the same beer by just adding sugar or just adding more grain and you can get the same dirty plato for a barley wine but if you go achieve those 30 platos by boiling they're far more complex than achieving the same dirty plato 
by adding sugars or grain to it. So there's something definitely that uh, boiling for long uh, periods of time that does to the beers. And I think it's a way, a great way to achieve uh, great flavors for some of these uh, thick, big beers. Yeah. So I've heard of breweries uh, doing a boil for 24 hours. Are we going to see that uh, anytime soon from you? <laughs> maybe, maybe if management allows me. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I, I want to. Yeah. Cool. Do we have any wort left by then? Our our kettle is far too strong to, to do something like that. Our kettle is oversized. <laughs> I, I have I have a plan. You gotta trust me on this. <laughs> cool. So are you making any additions other than hops to your boil? Are you adding any sugars or are you adding any, uh, yeah, something? We do world flock, yeah. uh, just processing aids, that's all. World flock, some yeast, yeast nutrients. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, okay. that's it, I okay. think. Yeah. Sometimes a flame out of hops, uh, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I guess only spices if we're doing a uh, some beer with spices. I know we've done a Nordic Star two years back for Christmas. We've done a, a, one that tastes my Yule Log last year for Christmas season. And the beers where we use spices, we usually tend them to use a uh, hot cider in Whirlpool, but often we don't do great additions during both. Okay, cool. Okay, so moving on to uh, fermentation. Um... How, how are you cooling uh, the wort down? Uh, is that a, a plate chiller or? It's a, yeah, it's a pretty big plate chiller. Um, usually do the, we need like, we need it like 30 minutes, between 30 minutes and an hour to get the whole kettle into the fermenter. Okay. How, how many liters is one kettle? 2,500. So 25 liters. Yeah. We can pump it up to almost 30. Um, but usually it's, uh, we, we calculate everything based on 25, 26 hectoliters. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then are, are you oxygenating it when it arrives in the, in the fermentation tank or, or what are you doing then? So, in line after the heat exchanger. So there's a there's a car carbonation stone uh, after the heat exchanger. So when the water is cooled down, uh, we can pretty easily control the amount of oxygen that's going in. Yeah. We done we done measurements. We have a portable oxygen meter, uh, and usually it's what we expect it to be. So that's quite nice. Yeah, because I know when I when I brew big stouts, I guess when everyone brew big stouts, uh, the most important thing is probably uh, yeast health, right? Yeah, so yeah. If, if your if your yeast is not happy, you are not gonna be happy at the end. No. <laughs> so what are you what are you doing to keep your yeast happy? We do we do quite some oxygenation. It's it's actually funny. We do more oxygen for the IPAs, I would say, because the yeast is just more hungry for oxygen. Well, um, we do like three grams a liter, right, George? Three liters per minute, which three counts liters. for about uh, 27 ppm, which is very on the high end. So I think we actually do the same rate for IPAs and stouts. The thing is, proportionally, it's lower for stouts. Uh, given the amount of initial sugar content you're aiming for. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think if you aim for the grand rule of uh, 1 ppm of oxygen per degree Plato, you should be fine. So we only we do 20 to 24 and stouts and the same for IPAs, but that's because English strains that uh, ferment uh, New England style IPAs, they're very savvy for oxygen, so we need to go extra. Oxygen, but I think Rowan wants to really talk about our propagation system that I very much. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you set me up there. There we go. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was, That's what like, I can talk about. Yeah. It's the since a couple, I, I think it's been uh, like six months now. We have a proper uh, propagator. 
So that's a 700 liter uh, bezel that has a, a spinner in the middle that can make sure that everything is homogeneous all the time. Uh, we have a automatic oxygenation system, meaning that there is a pulse going every five minutes with oxygen. Um, so we can go for uh, maximum yeast growth um, instead of the fermentation. So yeast has two different pathways it can take. It's uh, either cell growth or fermentation. And by giving it a constant stream of oxygen, you will push it into the growth phase. Mm. This, practically speaking, that means that we can uh, turn one one yeast cell into uh, it's uh, if we do homebrew packs, we can turn five into twenty within twenty four hours, and those twenty will go to. 100 uh, in 48 hours. Yeah. Um, so it's like we can get away with uh, a lot now with the healthy yeast we get. Um, let's, let's see. Usually, it, yeah, it gets four times growth within 24 hours and then even more 48. Uh, so what we have been doing is we do a propagation of a certain yeast, uh, whatever we want. We pull a part out of the propagator, and in the same cast of wort going to the fermenter, we push wort back into the propagator. So you start a second propagation for the next batch. Yeah. So we've been planning beers now uh, that one week has the same yeast, and then the week after has the same yeast. Okay. So we. We go as efficiently as possible with the yeast we have. Yeah, so you're not just you're not just using one yeast. You don't have a house yeast. You're you're changing them up all the time. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, for now, we've been doing a lot of uh, playing around. But yeah. before that, we did a lot of uh, dry and direct pitches. So this is like a okay a breath of new air. Let's yeah. Say. So, what yeast is in motor oil? Is that an uh, SO4 or is it what was that? Uh, USO5. It's the American strain. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is that the same in the in the blue coat, the blue bar coat? Uh, I guess so. But it that's a bit hard to say because the barrel aged beers are always a blend of certain barrels, um, and we don't really put beer on barrels with a certain idea in mind. We give the barrel master the the freedom to blend certain flavors together, do trials to see what is the best blend. Mm -hmm. So it might be that there are actually three or four different. No, it's not. But in the future, it can be. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. But there's actually awesome. multiple different ones in there. Yeah. So what about uh, so now we oxygenated the wort. We added yeast, so now it's packed to the beer. Are you recirculating in the tank, or is it just are you just leaving it there, or, or what's your fermentation like? Um, so we oxygenate uh, throughout the whole cast of the beer, so putting it in the fermenter. So the oxygen is already everywhere, and the yeast is liquid. And we push it from the propagator into after the uh, at the same moment as the oxygen actually yeah. so it's all in line we put the yeast in in line as well so the yeast and oxygen are everywhere in the tank already from the okay. from the get-go yeah so you don't re uh, recirculate anything no. No, no no not needed okay how long are you uh are you fermenting for uh, how long time does it ferment uh, motor oil is usually like 10 to 12 days, but we have done imperial stouts as fast as uh, a bit more than a week. Yeah. So like seven, eight days. Is that active fermentation or is it with a VDK rest? Um, we usually don't do a VDK rest. 
Yeah, we do. We don't do a test. We do a rest. So we go up in temperature. Yeah, okay. So we when get it to... When are you ramping the temperature up? Is that when you are uh, just about hitting your final gravity and then you ramp up the temperature or how? Um, it depends a little bit on the beer. Um, if we want to make, if it's a yeast strain that throws a lot of esters, uh, we want to make, and we don't really want the esters. We keep the cold phase a bit longer just to be sure that it doesn't make too much esters. Yeah. Um, because it's a very stressful environment, those beers. It's, uh, usually like 30 Play-Doh or more. So if you go too warm in the beginning, uh, your yeast will just start to die at some point. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And it would also, what's your opinion about, uh, because in my experience, if you have, a, if you're making a, a strong stout, a strong beer, um, if you start fermenting at a high temperature, you will get more boozy notes in the end. If you yeah. start low and then ramp it up just slowly, you get a more, uh, yeah, just a fuller beer and, and no booziness. Uh, what is your experience with that? So yeast usually makes the esters in the first three days of fermentation. Uh, so that's why we always keep the beer at a certain temperature for three days. And then depending on how sure we want to make that the esters don't go out of hand, uh, we let it go. Yeah. Uh, it's like a saison kind of thing at some point you start low and you just let it free rise to 24 26. okay so you, you you're not cooling it down at all you're just letting it free rise we hold it at uh at a at first temperature so that's usually either 19 or 21 it depends a lot on what yeast you're using yeah it can be 15. So primary fermentation temperature, and after three or four days, we uh, let the cooling off, and it will rise on its own to uh, 24 or 25, and then we kept it again because okay. you don't want to go higher because yeah. the yeast will kill itself. Okay, awesome. So, you, what about the VDK rest? You say you don't really, you're not concerned about that, or they're not concerned about off flavors in that way. Is that because you have so much control over your the, the initial fermentation, or because usually I, my rule of thumb is if you uh, have an active fermentation in five days, you have to give it five days uh, for a VDK rest. We uh, give it a VDK rest as long as the beer needs to get stable. Okay. So we just let it. Uh, so let's say we have we have. Uh, Imperial style that starts at 19 C. Um, after three days, we let it go to uh, 25 or 24. And then we just keep it at that temperature until the final gravity is stable. And then we crush it. And in our beers, you will not, if there is any diastol left, you will not taste it because there's so much going on. Yeah, 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 you're probably right. What's your take? You have to be more careful but yeah yeah okay so in, in stouts it's not that uh, big of a deal in uh in ipas or other beers it's more of a big deal yeah yeah we have done a west coast a couple of west coast ipas that we thought yeah this needs a little bit longer warm yeah yeah okay so you're just tasting uh every day to see when it's ready uh, yeah, when we do uh, alcohol measurements, so we have uh, Anton Par. Yeah, it's an LX500, but it's it's like an alkalizer, so you can very um, precisely measure uh, the gravity and the alcohol. Okay. Meaning that we can very precisely say when the beer is stable when it's done. Yeah. And then we just Cold crush it and uh, go from there. Okay. So what's uh, what's your take or what's your opinion on adding uh, muscovado sugar or any other sugars in the fermentation? Are you doing that? I want to do this one, George. 
you've been silent for a bit. I'm sorry. I, I got all your hands on yeast. It's just you set you set me up and there I go. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It was a trap. I was setting you up for a trap. Uh, no, I took some time to get some answers uh, out of yeah, the. Yeah, that's awesome. So, um, yeah, I I was just uh, entertained by listening to you. No, I mean the sugar addition. Uh, we do use sugars. There's no point about not saying we don't use sugars. I mean we grow these 30 to 40 plato beers, so we obviously end up using some sugars. We try to use mostly uh, maltose uh, syrups whenever we got to refer to those. Uh, but we also see sugar as an, as an ingredient. Uh, that's fun because most breweries would just look at sugar as a way to get to a, a mean to get to an end. But we've used a different range of uh, sugars. We've used uh, Muscovado, for example, to impart some more of the caramel flavors. We've used Belgium candy syrup just recently to brew a Belgium inspired uh, stout. We use malted extreme to get some uh, uh, thicker backbone. Uh, we don't use any lactose. That's something we've uh, stopped doing over a year ago. Yeah. Honestly, that's just a philosophical standpoint on a sustainable, the sustainable aspect. And also because of sustainable on the beer itself. We've seen some of the beers, they don't age as well when they have lactose mm -hmm. in it. So we just stopped using completely. Okay. Because we like our beers to age better as fast as possible. Um, Muscovado, we've used a few times. We've used some uh, other darker molasses uh, style uh, sugars, uh, but we use them during fermentation if needed. We use them uh, during boil if needed. We've used them after the beer is actually done and right about to be packaged. So we don't uh, pasteurize any of our beers, but you've got other means to stabilize. And most of all, we also centrifuge uh, our beers, so they're free of yeast and uh, particles. So we get some, uh, we can ensure some uh, stability on the product. And we've added some uh, post fermentation sugars as well to uh, capture, better capture the flavor. Uh, because if you add the sugar, sugar during fermentation, I recall we did the uh, maple syrup once. Uh, and we did like 10 or 15% of the whole recipe was maple syrup, something that was just uh, from a financial standpoint, just not a uh, reasonable, mm -hmm. and the beer had no uh, maple flavor, even though it was like 15 percent in there. So we have then used some maple uh, syrup post fermentation to capture better the flavor of maple syrup. So it really depends on what you're trying to get again. Okay, so you actually have tried to back sweeten with maple syrup. Because you centrifuge and all the yeast is gone, so you can actually back sweeten it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We well, you can also freeze the steel a beer like we've done in some of these beers. Yeah. I guess we can uh, leave that uh, freeze distillation process for a second uh, uh, opportunity, but it's something that we also do around here to concentrate the alcohol content that also creates stability. Okay. Uh, in your products. That's a huge amount of beer to freeze distillate. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, what about pH in your? Are you are you worried about the pH going into the fermenter? As a checking mechanism, yes, it's yeah. checking if the batches are reliable. I would say. Okay. So it's just not so checking. much. Not so much on the pH for fermentation. We have dialed in the. Yeah, it's pretty well right now. Yeah, so we've tried to adjust that. So there's a lot of brewers that tend to brew by numbers and not a reference to the brewery, just actually brew by a technical standpoint where you read that your uh, post boil pH should be comprised between 4.9 and 5.1 uh, pH. And uh, they go to the extent of adding extra minerals to it to just make sure their word is within the guidelines. We've tried that, but since we run this uh, direct fire kettle, our pH is usually on the lower end at 4.7 to 4.8 uh, post boil because it just caramelizes a lot and brings a lot of the well, caramel as low pH, brings out some of these acidic compounds that bring down the pH. Uh, back in the past, we tried to adjust that to, uh, you know, play by the book and make sure that we were within standards. But more and more, we're trying to just uh, let the beer talk itself and uh, make these decisions uh, flavor driven. Okay. And not as much uh, 
data driven. So we tend to just let the pH, if it is 4.6, sometimes happens uh, going into the FB, we just let it be. And usually the final pH in a beer, and Rowan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I am, the finishing pH in beer is not related to the starting pH before fermentation. So it doesn't mean if you if you start low for a style, like 4.6, 4.7 sounds super low because your finishing pH should be between 4.2 and 4.5. Yeah. So 4.6, 4.7 sounds to be super low. But what we see, it's uh, they're not correlated uh, most of the times. Okay, so where are you ending up? Are you ending up at around those 4.2 or 4.5 or what? It really depends on the on the beer and the yeast. I would say mostly depends on the yeast and if you're doing any dry ups. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, usually we get our imperial styles between four four and four six. Okay. Uh, that's that's normal. And we yeah. are not worried at all. Um, if it is lower, we will probably look into the process if something happens. And the same if it's higher. Like, uh, did we use any adjuncts that uh, increase the pH significantly? We we have seen some beers that go that you, that as high that you almost get uncomfortable, but not really, because uh, there's so much alcohol, it should be fine. Yeah. Okay, so you, you're not adjusting the final pH, you are just taking a measurement to see if it's uh, actually just in the ballpark, or, or, or you hit your target number, and you don't adjust it, and if there's something That's wrong, bigger. you will take a look at the process instead. No, we, we look at the flavor first and then check the pH, if the pH matches the flavor. So uh, usually if you have a lower pH, you will get some more in stouts roasty notes, some more uh, sharp notes. Uh, and if you get the pH higher, it will be more round. Uh, Sometimes chalky, it's just a thing to watch out for. Um, but if the flavor lacks something, pH is usually one of the things we look at to tweak. But uh, we don't do a lot of that in stouts, though. It's, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, basically, that was, yeah, we went through the motor oil. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the barcode because that's a that's a barrel aged beer, and uh, what are your thoughts on barrel aging in general? Because uh, again, like just like the Imperial Stouts, I think you're one of the best breweries uh, in Europe to to barrel aged beers. Um, so so what's how do you select the barrels and what's your philosophy behind the barrel aging? So, shall, shall I take this one, George, or do you want to take this one? No, I'll, I'll go this one in memory of our dear colleague, Michiel. So, uh, Michiel is our barrel manager. He takes great care of the barrels. It's uh, funny because it kind of sells a line between regular beaters and barrel age beaters. But we share the same principle of uh, deciding beaters by flavor. So, while well, most other breweries, they just uh, decide they have this uh, brand. That should go well into a barrel. They just make the same beer, put it in a barrel, and magically hope that something nice comes out of it. Uh, but we've seen that uh, it doesn't work that way. So the beers you brew to uh, have barrel age, they're not necessarily the same beers you brew to have regularly. So we often don't do uh, mulch oil barrel age, for example. It's something that we just don't do uh, anymore. So our current approach with most of uh, the barrel age styles, we just uh, get a base. Uh, stout brewed, and by base I mean uh, 40 Plato, between 35 and 40 Plato, so a bit higher than the regular beers. Uh, there we use some unfermentable sugars to make sure uh, they would stand enough body to go over the aging process, which we've seen that tends to try drive away some body and some uh, mm. depth from these beers, so they need to be really thick and creamy going in. It's quite fun because most beers that go into barrel aging are borderline drinkable, as in they don't really taste good, but 
when they came out, they're insane. So uh, that's kind of the funny thing about barrel aged beers. Um, but we just make that beer usually also more bitter, a bit more roasted malt. So just everything but more to achieve uh, that intensity. But we don't we don't have a goal in our site. So we don't make a recipe saying we're going to use marshmallows. We don't make a beer saying we're going to use coconut. We have the barrels and we can make up words that fits those barrels. So let's say you have a port wine, for example. Uh, port wine carries a lot of these uh, cherry uh, notes to it and some acidity. So for those recipes, maybe we get some uh, more uh, dried fruit, like specialty uh, malts that will, and dark uh, roast caramel malts that will enhance those uh, prune plum-like flavors that will pair well with the cherry notes from the port barrel. If we have some uh, bourbons, maybe we go for a plain base where we just uh, focus on a lot of caramels to capture a lot of that coconut vanilla you get from bourbons and so on, so on, so on. So we try to have a palette of uh, elements in our uh, barrel uh, warehouse. We keep about 260 barrels these days. So it's quite a lot. It's quite a lot of space to manage uh, and quite a lot of barrels to taste as well, which is good, but takes a lot of work. So Michiel just goes around every other week with a tasting uh, set. So we try to, uh, after, so we have a schedule, a pretty elaborate one, that after six months, we start testing out the barrels. Usually less is better for barrel aged out. So, or for barrel aged beers in general. When you see three years, I tend to frown upon, I think the sweet spot's about one year old barrels because you still have uh, beer flavor and some of the uh, barrel flavor in there. Uh, but Mihil just goes around collecting uh, tasting notes on those barrels. And we try to rate them, see which ones are aging and performing better. And uh, then depending on the necessity of projects, we'll uh, assemble some of these beers. Some others get picked for the indulgence for our guild membership club that uh, every two months has a exclusive release of a barrel aged beer. No items, just a pure stout and a barrel. Uh, but it's a lot of work trying to figure out how these uh, pieces fit together to make the puzzle. For example, if I tell you that uh, in a session we have uh, six beers, three beers clearly stand out. They're the best out of the six individually. And any sane person would think that uh, the three best, when combined together, would make it even better. That's just uh, logical reasoning. But the funny thing is, if you mix up the three best barrels that we have on that session, it does not always mean that it's a better beer. We've seen cases where the combination of three great beers turn out to be a bad beer. I'm not sure how this is possible, but that's why we have to make these decisions flavor-driven and not necessarily just randomly pick them. So sometimes the not so good barrels on their own, they will impart some flavor ranges to the best beer we have. And when combined, it gets something amazing. So uh, great props to Michiel. I'm not sure if he's around, but uh, he's doing a lot of this uh, boring work to find the the right combinations to make it really worthwhile. The same with adjuncts. And after we have the base blend, we uh, make a sample and analyze if, if and what adjuncts are suitable to the beer. OK. Yeah, awesome. So, so basically, you're, yeah, I heard that before. If you're gonna barrel age, you need a thicker beer. So, uh, yeah, and then you're you're actually dialing in your recipe for each uh, barrel. Um, yeah, I think that's awesome. What about? Uh, are, are you worried about oxygen and uh, infections in your barrels, or are your stouts that? They are high in, AB, in ABV, so are they are they not uh, taking any infections in, or how are you treating your barrels? So um, usually we get our barrels pretty fresh, meaning that they still have liquor in them, uh, meaning that they still should be sterile. But sometimes we need to roll them around to make get the liquor everywhere. But uh, usually our beers will also take care of it. Uh, and 
oxygen, yeah, yeah, we are quite concerned about it because if you put a a uh, imperial stout on barrels and uh, you keep you, you keep the headspace in the barrel like this, you will end up with uh, soy sauce. Okay. Uh, that's the oxidation effect of uh, on imperial stouts. Uh, usually it gets uh, soy. Mm. Um, so Michiel uh, tops them off several times. So he, he does the first round and uh, fermentation makes CO2. So you usually have a bit of foam on top, um, which will collapse over time. Uh, so he puts an airlock on it and then puts a little bit more beer in there just to make sure there's no oxygen in the headspace. But the micro oxygenation uh, by the wood, we are not concerned about. That's so little that it's usually the right amount we want to have because it also contributes to uh, the beer complexity at the end. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's part of the flavor, it's part of the barrel aging. Yeah. So what about temperature? Do you keep the, the barrels in a cool storage facility or is it just in the, in the in the warehouse or, or how? It's in the in the warehouse, so it's open to the changes of season. But it actually helps the barrel aging process, I would say, because wood expands and contracts yeah. when it gets uh, warmer and colder, meaning that you get a faster uh, interaction between the wood and the and the beer. Okay. So I think. You should not keep your barrel in a climate controlled room because it will just slow down your aging. Okay. Do you agree, George? That's uh... <laughs> Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, if you have in a climate uh, controlled room, you can actually control your climate. So you, you can simulate the seasons, but I do agree that uh, the seasonal rotation helps with barrels. I think Melbourne's being uh, naturally uh, off cold uh, country actually helps. Uh, back my days in Portugal, you'd see a much faster aging uh, because the weather was just uh, warmer. So aging at 30 degrees Celsius will just uh, accelerate the reactions. So if you're able to go a little bit colder and some changes, you can uh, better find the peak point of taste in uh, each of uh, your barrels. Cool. Do you have any favorite barrels? Uh, any favorite companies you get barrels from? Well, companies exactly. I'm not sure who we work with. That's uh, more on uh, Michiel's uh, field of expertise. I would say that bourbons are uh, just a natural fit uh, yeah. for stout. Yeah. They're yeah. just a natural fit. I mean, I really like rum, but that's because that's maybe the only spirit that I actually care for. Okay. So if I have to drink a spirit, that's the only one, or a spirit neat with nothing added. It's the one that I enjoy the most. I'm not much of a whiskey or a bourbon guy, but I think in stouts, they, uh, can, they can be pretty nice if they're worked well uh, nicely, like the beer uh, you have there, the barcode blue, platinum and blue. It's a bourbon and rum uh, barrel age. But I'd say bourbon, it's just a perfect fit for uh, stouts. Yeah, yeah, it seems to be a popular choice. Yeah, cool. So I quite like the tequila as well, though. It's like it gives a punch. Tequila is like pure. When it gets back into the beer, it's like a booze punch, which is can really help the balance in a beer sometimes. But yeah, it's from bourbon tequila. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So what about uh? So. Now we got the, the beer in the barrel and it's done. So it's time for uh, it's time for getting it in cans or bottles. Um, what what's the process there? Um, is it going back into a tank to carbonate? Uh, or, or what are what are you doing? And what are you measuring? Are you measuring pH again, or is it just going on bottles? Yeah. So usually, uh, Michiel does trials first. Uh, before we put something back in a tank. So we uh, uh, trials what barrels needs to get into the tank. 
And then we uh, uh, get them in the bright beer tank. We send a sample to the lab because we care a lot about uh, not exploding our cans or bottles. <laughs> um, usually, I think on barrel ice beers, we never had a contamination. Uh, but it's something to keep in mind and always check because the problem can be in a very small corner, I would say. Um, so we get it into the bright beer tank. Uh, we carbonate it and then we taste it from the tank. And then we decide if it needs something else. Um, okay, can so be a mineral addition, can be acid, can be uh, uh, like the beer you are about to taste. I don't know if you cracked it yet, but uh, no. the, the barcode, I think we thought it needed some, some spice, some nuttiness, uh, maybe towards cinnamon. And that's exactly what Tonka will provide. Because that's the one with Tonka, right? The Tonka rum and bourbon. Yeah. 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 Okay. So then so we you, decide. So you actually add yeah. some adjuncts uh, right there after the barrel aging in the bright tank? If needed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. If, yeah. If the adjuncts are always post barrel aging and not before barrel aging. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it gets. Uh, any oxygen will hurt adjuncts even more than the beer. So, okay, okay, cool. Yeah, well, I guess that was all my questions about the process. So, um, so now we're getting into the glass. So, what's the best way to drink an imperial stout in your eyes? What's the temperature like? What's the what should the glass be like? So what, I, what I learned was that the temperature of the stout should be the amount of alcohol that's in there. So if you have a 15% uh, ABV stout, it should be 15C. Yeah. I like them a touch colder than that because our barrel age beers are usually like uh, 14, 15, 16% alcohol. Um, like the 12 C, I think is nice. Uh, for the glassware, George, what would you recommend? Go on. <laughs> I would go with the snifter. And uh, on the temperature, what I would say, like it depends if you're um, in the beer or you're not, but since we sell most of our beers, well, we sell all of our beers in 44 CL cans with the exception of indulgence that comes in a 37.5 CL bottle. If you're drinking the beer you're on, what I would say, just uh, add the beer in the refrigerator, take it off, open it, uh, catch yourself maybe a small pour and get acquainted with the beer. And after, you know, as you drink through the beer, uh, it's not a beer that you drink in a half an hour or no. 20 minutes. Maybe it takes you a couple of hours to get through a full can if you're doing uh, your own. So I like to see the beers kind of developing in flavors because, uh, Due to our job nature, we get to drink these beers uh, super cold because they need to be kept super cold before packaging. And uh, they show a certain profile. So we get to experience the beers more cold than most people. And then as they warm up, they develop flavors. So I think that's also a good experience that the consumer should have just um, being able to see the beer increase in temperature. And I think a snifter, if you hold it with a palm in your hands, it will just warm yeah. up as you see it through it. So just like that. So it's kind of a journey to see how the beer uh, yeah. warms up and the flavors open up. If there's one set temperature, I agree with Rowan, it should be fairly the amount of um, degree numbers that's in there. So it should be like 14C, 12C for most of our beers. Uh, but I would say that even higher, like, uh, 20, 20 some C like body temperature would be an interesting um, approach. Uh, there's uh, some brandy uh, culture where people actually warm up glasses to drink uh, warm brandies at 30 some C. And I think that also can benefit a stout to develop some and get really some more volatiles out there. So if you have a can for yourself, you can pretty much drink like three different beers, <laughs> starting cold, going to room temperature and going to slightly warm. Yeah, and, uh, you get yourself three 
a 15 CL course that get, gives you three completely different experiences. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for listening to the podcast Beer and People from Beer Stories. Visit my YouTube channel Beer Stories for how-to videos for homebrewing, tips, tricks, guides, interviews, and much more. You can also follow my blog on Instagram or Facebook or visit my website beerstories.dk.